everyone. Today we're going to continue on with two days in one suitcase. We are almost to part four, excitingly. So we're going to continue reading today, so hopefully we'll make some progress. So tomorrow we can read for part four. Sorry, I look kind of tired. <laughs> um, I just got back from the classroom and I packed up all 29 of you and your classmates' belongings. So those will be available in about two weeks for pickup for your parents. Um, yeah, let's get started. Edna and Molly left, having eaten too many french fries to need to go into the mess hall. A while later, Dad joined the rest of us for glasses of lemonade and talk. Are there gatherings for everyone here, like dances, dinners, or other celebrations? Mom asked Dad. I haven't heard of anything like that, he said. I doubt there are any kinds of gatherings for everyone to do things together. I think the staff people, for the most part, keep pretty separate from everyone else. I have heard them use the term the colony to refer to the part of the camp where the internees live. He and my mom exchanged meaningful looks. Larry and I looked to Mari for an explanation. So often she questioned our parents and Larry and I had learned something we wanted to know. Uh, and that is exactly what happened now. A colony, Mari had explained, like the original 13 states that were the colony of England, mom nodded. A colony is not free, but it must do what the controlling country wants. Dad nodded. But this camp isn't really a colony. We're all still in the United States, which is a free country, Larry said. Yes, but I think the staff people use that term as a symbol. Colonists are often looked down upon by the country in charge, Dad said, adding that the internees aren't really free here. I knew they were not free, but I suddenly wondered about the citizens in a free country. I felt really confused. I thought you said that most of the people here are American citizens, but I am wrong. Are the people here not citizens? Am I wrong? You are correct. Most of the people here are citizens. They are born here just like you and I were, Mom said. You may have found that some of the grandparents and a few of the parents were born in Japan, but that does not make them people who should still be imprisoned. Why haven't they become citizens yet? I asked, still very confused. Because there was a law made in 1790 that says Asian people not born in the United States cannot become citizens, Dad said. Larry whistled and shook his head saying, that was over 150 years ago. I admired his ability to do arithmetic, which is math, quickly. I learned in school that the words to the national anthem were written in 1814, said Larry. We have been singing the land of the free and the home of the brave for a long time, but I never thought about it only being for certain people. I'll never sing that song again without thinking about the excluded people. He paused and then added, maybe I'll never sing it again, period. Mari said with determination, well, there are many ways to exclude and imprison certain people, but right here, right now, there is something I can do about that. She had a look on her face we all knew. Mari was scheming, meaning that she was planning something. We let her scheme. She would tell us when she was ready. I went to bed before Mari and lay awake in the summer twilight. I found myself thinking about my dollhouse. It had been a gift by my grandfather the year before he died. He had not only made the dollhouse, but all the tiny furniture too. Mom called it a labor of love. Now I could feel grandpa's love every time I saw the dollhouse. I could still feel it even now. I missed him and wondered where he was. Hmm. The next morning, the dad went off to work and Larry, having found out there was a baseball league, had gone to find out where he could sign up. Mom was off somewhere. Mari and I had just finished up the dishes and Mari was writing Japanese sentences on the blackboard. There was a knock on the door. It was Edna, hoping to borrow a book. We were all talking when mom came into the house, her arms full of laundry. We had wondered where she was. Whose clothes are those? Mari asked. They're mostly white. Anyone who could avoid wearing white would do so in this place of dust and sand. This is the sacred wash, Mom quipped. I told Father Swift we would do the church's laundry. Edna looked at her curiously. Mrs. Hannon, what do you mean by the church laundry? It is a building. How can a building have laundry? Mom laughed. 
the altar cloth. <laughs> All the white cloths used for math, okay? I had a feeling that I would be roped into that and I was right. In the afternoon, I noticed my mother bringing the box. Wherever we went, such as to a new army base, mom brought along this old cardboard box. And like a magician, she pulled out the most amazing stuff out of it. No matter what she, what it was she needed, she would improvise something that would do. She sewed beautifully. She had made Mari a prom dress last spring out of a bunch of old curtains, and Mari looked lovely. So, what are you going to magically create now, Mom? I asked. She smiled at me, appreciating the compliment. As she was rummaging through it, she said, well, Mari's preparing that little girl for her first communion, so she'll need a special dress, perhaps a wreath of some sort for her hair. I could tell she was lost in her plan, so I left her to it. But I wasn't surprised when, an hour later, I saw some white cloth that had been freshly ironed. Now it was laid out on the table, and Mom was happily cutting it out to a little dress. Mari came to see what was going on. Oh, Mom, Mikiko will be so happy when she sees this, Mari said, giving Mom a big hug. Well, Mom said, scissors in hand, she must have something beautiful for this important day. It'll make her understand just how important it is. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, just how important it is. My mother had a down-to-earth way of combining the spiritual parts of life with the practical things. She never separated them. Mickey Go was about to have a spiritual celebration, so Mom figured that she would need a new dress, and she made her one. That evening, Dad came home. He looked very tired. I could tell that he was already really agitated, too. He had taken this job not only knowing that he would be helping some Japanese Americans who had been forced to live their lives behind, more, behind bars more than three years ago. Now I guessed he had a better understanding of the kind of help they would need for him. Tell us what is going on, said mom. He sat down as if weighted down with what he had to say. These people had two days notice to walk away from their lives. Two days. They could only bring what they could fit in one suitcase with no idea of the climate, the place they were being sent to. And in those days, everything had to be dealt with. House and everything in it, the car, the work, maybe a store, a business, a profession, a farm with growing crops and animals. You couldn't even take a pet. I wanted to ask what had happened to their pets, but the conversation moved along too swiftly. They couldn't sell their stuff, Larry asked. Again, I thought of my dollhouse, which I would never sell no matter what. There was no time for that. But even worse, given how fast everything was happening, who would buy anything? Why buy something when all you ought to do was wait around those two days for the families to leave and then walk into the houses and take what you want, Dad said grimly. You mean, you think people are just stealing things? Maureen asked. Dad nodded. Do you think others may have moved into empty houses? Mom asked softly. I think that's very likely. And I don't know how many of the people forced to come here will have any way of getting those homes back again, Dad said. The government made no attempt to secure or safeguard any of the things that had been left behind. I don't think it entered their mind to even think about trying to protect them. There was a moment of quiet as we were mulling this over. Then Dad went on. I think there are about 120,000 people locked up in these so-called camps. Mom and Mari both gasped. <gasps> I struggled to imagine a number that big. Larry repeated it. 120,000 people? And those in charge of gathering and forcing all those people into these prison camps were unbelievably thorough, Dad said. Anyone with a drop of Japanese blood was locked up. In fact, I was told that they scooped up babies from three orphanages, two in Los Angeles and one in San Francisco. Orphaned children. <sighs> There's a rumor that in one of the camps, there was a little boy with curly red hair who was 132nd, so that's a fraction, one over 32, Japanese. Now, I don't know if that is true, but the way they're rounding up everyone, I can almost believe it. Where are the orphaned children now? Mari asked. 
How can little kids be any kind of threat, I asked, anger brewing inside of me. Where are these children now, Mari repeated. Dad said he didn't know. At work today, I got to talking with the staff person who was one of the first to arrive here. Apparently, the center was not finished before the first evacuees were forced to leave their homes and come here. The West Coast Defense Command refused to change the schedule, though, so they were put on trains and arrived here. What a disaster that was. Edna told us about that. She and her family were some of the first people here. They didn't even have enough bathrooms or mess halls or places to sleep, I said. Dad sighed and nodded. Sounds like it was really terrible. Imagine being forced to leave everything you love, everything that made you feel safe, only to arrive on a train at night in a place that didn't even have lights set up yet. Families got, sorry. Families got off the train arriving after dark. They had a scramble along being led by others holding candles. Often children and adults fell into holes dug for new buildings. I closed my eyes and imagined Edna, Edna and Molly carrying suitcases and trying to follow someone with just a candle to lead the way through construction, dirt, and uneven ground. One candle in the immense darkness. Dad had more to tell. People slept in makeshift houses made of cardboard. The only light at night was by candles. There were so few bathhouses that just to get water, people had to walk several blocks and the water supply for the camp was still inadequate and impure, so the water was hauled in from the town. Again, silence. We were not usually a quiet family. Once more, I pictured Molly and Edna having to sleep in the shacks made of cardboard with candles for light. Talk about a fire hazard. This was just not a problem of not being ready. This was cruel. I wondered why neither Molly nor Edna had told us how bad it really had been when they first arrived here. Dad said as much to himself as to us. Those conditions, cardboard shelters, dangerous candles, bad water, that is just a complete disregard for human life. Our government doesn't see them as human beings. It, seem, it sees them as some dangerous creatures with no value who simply have to be kept alive. I winced at the idea of little Mikiko and Edna as creatures of no value. Dad still needed to talk. To tell the truth, I don't think the government cared in the least how they were destroying these people's lives. Most of them will never again see anything that they had left behind. Their past lives are gone as though some evil witch had waved a wand. Then mom asked him, are you sorry we came here? Dad gave her a smile that meant he knew that she both shared in his frustration and in his mission. It would take Solomon himself to make things right for all these people, but I do think there is some value and comfort for these people just to know that someone knows and cares and is trying to help. Sometimes just trying to help is helping, Mari said. Dad opened his arms and we all fell into them in a comforting family hug. It was hot morning when Mari and I went off again to the colony for another lesson with Mikiko. This time I looked up at the guard tower. I had counted the towers I had seen so far and had gotten six. Larry was convinced that there were more. From my vantage point, the tower was set against the sky, which today was very blue and had a big rolling clouds. Of course, the ugly tower marred the sight. It made me think of the time I found a dead bird. I was really young and didn't understand that the bird held still because it was dead. It was a lovely blue jay whose colors could be the most true blue you could have ever seen. I bent over to look at the different shades of blue along with the white. I was enjoying it and suddenly I sat there and suddenly <clears throat> I was enjoying it and suddenly I saw that there was a cut in the underside. I examined the innards and I was able to see and shuddered at how that cut made the bird suddenly seem ugly. Mar, Mari noticed my gaze. Oops. I wonder what they are like, she said. Who? The guards. I looked again. It wasn't easy to see much of one in the tower today, but it was obvious that he had a gun and that he was watching us and everyone else. I thought he was wearing dark glasses. Wonder what it's like to have that job. He might not have wanted the job, or maybe he did. 
Maybe he may not know any of the people in the barracks or wonder about them. He may dislike them. Or maybe he feels uncomfortable with what he has to do, she mused. Then she switched to her usual tone. Let's walk another way than we did the other day. This just meant walking through different sections of drab color barracks set on sandy soil. I guess we were hoping to see if there was any relief to these endless and hopeless blocks. I noticed a few young trees here and there. I knew my mother would have said that they were probably planted in hope. In hope of making this place a better place? In hope that someday the planter would be back to a tree-filled place again? We also saw a victory garden. It was bigger than the sweet tiny plots I had seen the other day, but it was a garden as compared to the acres of vegetables planted nearby. I knew that victory gardens were planted to produce more food for people while our world was at war. In some countries, people had dug up their lawns and even tennis courts and rose gardens to turn them into gardens for vegetables, fruits, and herbs. But this one, here in this windswept, dry place, seemed like its own victory. How could it have survived? And yet it did, and it was surviving and doing well. I admired it, and the gardeners who showed so much hope and resilience just by planting it, given the poor conditions. Like my mom making a special dress for Mikiko, these people were doing what they could to make things a little better, and they weren't even letting the bad circumstances defeat them. Mari must have been thinking the same thing because she said, that little garden is a victory garden, really and truly, but not the way that most people think of them. Then we saw another makeshift playground with lots of kids shrieking on swings. There was always laundry flapping in the wind outside some of the barracks. Now we had gotten to Mikiko's quarters. She and her mother greeted us warmly at the door. Itsu and Tomimi uh, peeked out from behind their mother. I knew what they wanted. Can I take the little ones outside, Miss Naya? I asked. This time I had brought some crayons and paper with me. Squealing with a delight, Itsu and Tomi, uh, Tomomi, <coughs> sorry, Itsu and Tomomi jumped down with a little step in front of the door and Mikiko led Mari into the barracks. I heard Mari say, I bet you'd like to draw a picture too, Mikiko. I'm sure Helen will save a piece of paper for you. Wink, wink. We sat on the ground using a step as a table. I watched. I had intended to draw with them, but now I wanted to leave all the paper with them when we left. I had never seen little kids so happy to draw. Isu was amazing. He drew a picture of a little airplane with a million details on it. Then he added clouds and the sun. He must have decided the moon and some stars should be in the sky too. Carefully, he drew those in. Little Tamami seemed only able to draw lines and circles so far, but I noticed she was very thoughtful about which colors to choose. And she worked carefully to draw those lines and circles. But the drawings were finished before Mari and Mikiko were done. I noticed Catherine and Richard returning to their quarters. They had been helping their mother with the laundry. It's Sue grinned. I already knew that grin. It meant he had an idea. Richard, can we play kickball? Richard looked to his mother. She smiled and nodded. Richard and Catherine took the laundry into their place and then joined us. Soon a rowdy game of kickball was causing up the dust and sand to fly. Our shouts and laughter brought out other kids and soon adults when we had a small crowd. A little while later, Mari and Mikiko came outside hand in hand. I glanced at Mari. I could tell by the look on her face that like Itsu, she was hatching an idea. Probably the idea that she had been working on last night. As we walked back, she shared her idea with me to invite all of these kids, no matter their ages, to our house. It was so much bigger there and we had a few games. Maybe we could get some toys. We already had crayons and paper. Richard could bring the balls. And because Mari's ideas were usually good ones, and she never let a good idea get wasted, our heist became a meeting place for many children. Not many days passed before the colony kids were coming to our quarters every chance they got. Sometimes it looked like a daycare center with busy kids everywhere. Catherine and others set up board games and played by the hour. It turned out that Richard was quite the card shark. He taught lots of kids games, and mom saw to it that there were always potatoes. The kids all adored french fries, and Mari and Edna and Molly made them endlessly. 
magically every one of those french fries disappeared all right it looks like we still have quite a bit of pages before we get into part four so i'm going to stop it for today since it's already been about 20 minutes we'll continue with tomorrow and by friday we can move into part four i'm so excited as we continue to read on about the experiences of the american japanese in the um, internment camps. So again, it's called Two Days and One Suitcase. And this book was written by my grandma's sister, also known as my great aunt. Please do leave a comment or um, something. Just let me know that you're here. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or even ask the author for you. All right, thank you. See you tomorrow, bye.